Amen. Let's give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Wow. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, I read it earlier here. It says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the God, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, I'm going to read two more. I like Psalms 86, 12 in the New Life Version. It says, O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you with all my heart. I will bring honor to your name forever. And then Psalms 100, verse 4 through 5 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues forever through all generations. Amen. Uh, For many of you on November 1st, your holidays begin, right? On November 1st, some of y'all put up your Christmas trees already on November 1st, right? And so uh, it's it's a holiday season, right? Uh, And now we're ushering in uh, Christmas is coming up next month and New Year's and, uh, but next week is Thanksgiving and, uh, and for a lot of us, we may be coming together with family or, or you may be looking for family. I don't know what, what, where you may be at, but uh, a lot of us, we're going to be doing stuff possibly next week. For, for some of us, it's a hard day, right? It's hard for us to give thanks, maybe family loss or something that's been difficult, or whether, what, whatever it may be. But uh, today I, I invited a few members of our church to share their experiences and testimonies with an emphasis on God's faithfulness and gratitude with thanksgiving. See, gratitude is a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. And, uh, and it's a practice that radically transforms the, those who hear it and those who express it. In today's climate, nothing can be more important for the Christian than cultivating gratitude. And as the world grows darker and, and filled with more pain, and, and, and you know, it, what happens is that grateful people will shine with the light of Jesus and bring hope. How many believe that? Amen? And so Thanksgiving is a special time, right? It's a special time of the year when people express gratitude. And maybe you're, you're one of the ones who's impatient around the table. You're about to eat and you're, you got that one aunt that says, all right, we want to give thanks for something. Everyone, one by one. And your food's already been served. So you're, like, you're just like, I'm ready to eat, right? You got that one uncle that prays for six straight minutes. You know what I'm saying? And says, we, we're going to give God thanks right now. And you're like, <laughs> you know, squeezing in a bite or here. But whatever your culture is and wherever you come from, it's beautiful knowing that we can come together and give thanks and have gratitude, right? Cultivating a mindset of gratis, gratitude is not just during the holidays, but it's all year long. It, it's it, perhaps the most important key to finding health and happiness, Research by renowned psychologists has found that people who consciously practice a lifestyle of gratitude experience greater emotional well-being and physical health than people who do not. You believe that? That's amazing. So today I have a special group of people that that are up here. Uh, I have Miguel and Passion Santiago. Can we give it up for them? Sorry about that. Um, But Miguel and Passion, they are uh, small group leaders uh, they also are youth leaders. Uh, they're also in, uh, in our Revive Arts uh, team. They also are in RCU. <laughs> they're also in women's Bible journaling. They're, okay, it's time to calm down. <laughs> like, you know, no, no, uh, but they literally live out the DNA of Revive here. And so we're so grateful that they're here with us. Thank you. And uh, we also have Christy Lenham. Can we give it up for Christy? And... Uh, Christy, she serves in our Revive worship team. She serves with our Revive kids. She's back there with your kids sometimes. She serves with our Revive host team. Uh, and she also lives out the DNA of our church. And so I'm just grateful that they said yes to be able to, to be a little vulnerable today to share some of your story and, and testimony of what God's done and, and how grateful you are. So we're going to go right into it. I just hope that you're blessed today from what you hear. Amen. I hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you receive a, 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 a revelation, maybe to something that you're facing or going through or something you're waiting for or hoping for. And, and I'm truly believing that God is in this place today. Amen. And so I'm, I'm going to ask a question. And, and, and before I do so the to leading into this the, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon said when joy and prayer are married their firstborn child is gratitude wow so I, I want you guys to share an experience or testimony that has taught you the importance of gratitude 
Is it on? Oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> so for me, um, an experience that I've had that has taught me to be grateful for everything that God has done in my life is my baby. So from the time 12 years ago when I was 14, I began to have problems within my reproductive system. And by the time I was 16, the doctors told me that I would never have children or that I would have a lot of complications, miscarriages, be um, a high-risk pregnancy. And after the time that I would be 25, that it would be nearly impossible for me to have children. Um, the older I got, the harder it got. I was diagnosed with PCOS, endometriosis, pelvic, hypertonic pelvic floor, um, inflamed cervix. I went years of just throwing up constantly, not being able to move, not being able to function normally. Um, and it was really difficult. And it worsened when I got married to my husband. So we got married at 20. And uh, by the time that we had gotten married, I had already developed a high tolerance to pain medication. So anything that the doctor prescribed me, it was like water pills. I couldn't do anything. So I had to literally suffer in pain and kind of just wait it out. When I turned 21, I was in pain for two years straight. Every day I was um, sick, throwing up in bed. I could hardly move, could hardly walk. He had to carry me to bed a lot. He had to force me to eat because of how sick I was. And every time I went to the doctors, they knew me at that point, urgent care and um, the emergency room. I would come, I would tell them the same thing. I, I can't, I can't do anything. I need something. And they would do a run of a diagnosis and say that there was nothing wrong with me. Give me a shot in my butt that would last for about six hours, long enough for me to sleep. And then I would repeat. And um, I remember one day sitting and having a conversation with my husband. And I've known him since we were 12. And I said, I want you to understand that we may never be able to have children together. And he said, I knew that before I married you. And I remember just breaking down because we've always wanted children. And um, constantly hearing that it would never be a thing was really, really difficult. Right after we got married, um, I got pregnant and I miscarried at about seven weeks. And it was one of the most traumatizing and painful things that I had ever experienced because all that rang in my mind was what the doctors told me. Ever have children, you'll miscarry. It's never gonna happen for you. And um, when I really started to dig deep into my relationship with God, I've always grown up in the church, I've always believed, I've always known. But when I really started to seek him for myself, and not being under my parents, that's when I started to see a difference. Because even in the, the midst of me going through all of that pain and suffering, and um, in a sense still kind of believing what the doctor said, I still had a, a hope that we would be able to have children one day and that maybe even I would be healed through that. And so um, I found a group of people who would cover me in prayer, who would um, pour into me. And once my husband came to Christ, um, we decided we're going to try for children, even though they're saying that it could potentially kill me. And we prayed and prayed to God, you know, if this is your will that we are to have children, let us know. Give us confirmation. Allow it to be known. And at this point, we hadn't told anybody. We hadn't told our family, our friends, even the people who we were doing small groups with. And one day after I had cried in my car praying, like, God, I don't want to be chasing after a dream that isn't for me. We go to small groups that night and um, the family is praying over us. And as he's praying over me for healing in my body, he says, and Passion and Miguel will have their miracle child. That was three years ago, you know, um, and we held on to that because his wife had also, also prophesied that uh, we would, receive a huge gift, and we didn't want to assume that it was children, but she later revealed to us that that's exactly what it was. So um, after all those years of pain, you know, um, God allowed me to have, I guess you could say freedom. When we first moved back to Texas, I was able to finally um, operate normally. I could work out, I could eat, I could move and not be in pain. 
And um, it was great not having to go to the doctor every week and not having to worry if I'm going crazy. But in 2022, when we uh, were in between churches, I started having cyst bursts in a lot of them. And um, that was really, really hard because um, I had just lived almost an entire year of not having to worry about anything if I wasn't on my cycle. And when we came to Revive, we were called here. And I remember just being in a place of every Sunday I was at the front worshiping. Every Sunday I was on my knees worshiping. Every Sunday I was crying. I was weeping. I was at every altar call. And there were multiple times that my husband had to carry me out of this church because of the pain that was stricken within my body. And just having to constantly go through that was really, really hard. But I kept believing in the promise that God gave us. We will have our miracle child. We just had to wait on it. Not, not never, just not right now was the word that God gave me. Not never, just not right now. I had to continue to wait. And he didn't give me a time frame. He was just, you have to be obedient. You have to do what I've called you into. You have to go and continue to serve me with your entire heart. And don't worry about the fact that it hasn't come yet. Because in your obedience, there will be blessing. Amen. And we have to come to a place of understanding that regardless of how hard your circumstances are, God is with you. There, my pain wasn't in vain. My suffering wasn't in vain. My waiting wasn't in vain. It all had a purpose. There are so many women and families that I have helped through my testimony that I've been able to say, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen. I got pregnant. <laughs> I'll be seven months on, um, on Wednesday. <laughs> And um, right before I found out I was pregnant, I thought I was pregnant. And I had gone about 10 weeks without a cycle, but I had learned <laughs> to not take a pregnancy test right away because my cycles were still irregular and it was always kind of like a, a small pinch in my heart when I would see a negative. But um, I was really, really sure this time and it was right around Mother's Day and that's always a really hard day for me. And I remember um, I was supposed to go into the clinic on Monday and as I'm at work, I feel pain. And I'm like, oh, God. So I go to the bathroom, and I'm bleeding severely. And I'm like, oh. I thought this was it. And um, I cleaned myself up, and I came back. I'm a nanny, and came back to uh, watch my kids. And I just put on worship music like I always do. But I, I sung with my entire heart, and I prayed desperately, not for that thing to happen, but just thank you, because it's not the right time. <laughs> And um, something stirred up in me in that moment. And the following week, I actually got pregnant. And the way that I found out is one of my best friends called me, and she was like, I had a dream, and God said, you know, you're five weeks pregnant. And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. And um, after I got off work, I took a pregnancy test, and sure enough, it popped up positive very quickly. <laughs> 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 and... Um, I was in place of just like being so excited. I didn't even tell my husband. I was just like, I'm going for a walk. And I went out and prayed and cried for like three hours, <laughs> just giving him thanks because of the blessing that he bestowed upon us. And um, my pregnancy is the healthiest that I've ever been in my reproductive system in my entire life. I mean, the healthiest, no nausea. No, no problems with, you know, like not being able to operate. I'm still dancing full time in dance ministry. I'm still going to school. I'm still working. You know, all of the things that people say, are you having this? Are you having this? And I'm like, nope, it's another beautiful day. <laughs> and I've had even a couple of women who are pregnant, like, why, you know, why is your pregnancy? You look so great and you're able to do this. And I'm like, baby, you don't understand the, the story behind this. This was 12 years of suffering that no one knew about until I opened my mouth because I had become so accustomed to not talking about it because no one believed me. So, um, yeah, being, being grateful, even in the midst of not getting what you want, is the best thing that you can do because you never know when God is going to move. Wow. Wow. Amen. Come on, can we give God praise for that? That's... 
you know, uh, with, with Marie and I, we've, we've had the privilege of, of, you know, hearing the story and, and kind of going through a little bit of the journey with them and just something that I've always seen with passion and, and with Miguel is just how uh, faith forward they are, where it's like, you would never know that they're just kind of down and out or, um, and, and I remember where they were moving into a, a, a kind of a season where leadership was, they were, they were meant for leadership. And so I would be like, man, something's wrong with passion, right? Because she's coming to the altar call every Sunday. And I'm like, she's a leader. Like, you know, I'm just trying to think. It's like, sometimes you think like we all got it together. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't understand her story. I didn't know her story of what was happening in the moment that a lot of that was a response of gratitude. Uh, it was a response of thanksgiving. It was a response of like just saying, Lord, I'm here. And it blesses us when we see you dancing. We've had to tell passion, calm down. We've had, where's, where's uh, Edis and, and we would say, we've had to tell her, my, Dr. Murray, you know, he'd be like, no, that's now the seventh ministry you want to be involved in. <laughs> and it's just because of her encounter and her relationship with God, it, it bleeds faith and hope and gratitude and God has blessed them with that miracle. And so we can't wait till that little person arrives, right? Amen. <laughs> I'm going to go back to you, Miguel, but I'm, I'm going to ask you what, Christy, tell me a moment of, uh, of gratitude for your story, your testimony. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you mentioned freedom when you were talking, and I would say that freedom is something that I'm truly grateful for. Um, I grew up in a military household, spoiled rotten, um, really good in school. I was in an international baccalaureate program in high school. Um, until the, close to the end of my senior year and I fell into depression and, um, from there it just spiraled. I stopped going to school. I would leave for school and go park in the Walmart parking lot and just go to sleep. And there I would stay until it was time to go home. I forged letters to the school for excusing those absences. Um, and then it had gotten to a point that I was no longer able to get caught up in that program. And I had to go to the adult center to um, get my diploma and keep my scholarships. And so um, from there, I still was depressed. I had been to counseling and nothing had helped. I pretty much would tell the counselors the same thing that they would tell me and they would not counsel me. So um, when I was still 18, I ended up in a situation where I was taken advantage of. And I ended up pregnant. And at that time, I was, no way I was going to have an abortion. And so I, um, by the way, I'm anti-abortion. Uh, but I did have one. I mean, I didn't have one at that point, but later on. Um, so at that point, I had him. And I didn't realize how broken and traumatized I was by the experience that I had gone through. And it catapulted me into this lifestyle where... I surrounded myself by people that were completely different than how I had grown up. Um, I lived in the, the drug world. I sold drugs. I cooked drugs. I did drugs. And I drank. Um, and by the time I was 21, I had already been to jail. Um, I was manipulative, conniving, thieving, all the things that you can think of I was. Um, but everybody thought I was the greatest thing because I would give the shirt off my back for somebody. And so it was very hidden, um, except by my family. They pretty much knew, but they tried to believe that I wasn't all those things. Um, they would have people tell them, your daughter's doing this and that, and they'd be like, there's no way, not her. And so um, when I was 21, I um, at one point in time had been invited to church and I had been going for about three months. I stopped doing the things that I was doing, um, aside from smoking cigarettes, because I wasn't ready to give that up yet. But, um, and then one night, three months in, I was invited by some friends to go out. And so we went out, and um, this was a place that I had been to so many times that the bartender who hadn't seen me in a while was like, here, all your drinks are free tonight. It's good to see you. And um, I gave up my keys. But by the end of the night, I was so obliterated that I had blacked out, and my friends thought that I was sober. 
I wasn't slurring, I wasn't stumbling, and um, they gave me my keys back. So on my way home, um, somebody was basically trying to race me down the road, and I came to a curve, and at that point, I really don't remember much. Um, I ended up losing control, hitting a palm tree and cartwheeling about 150 yards. And uh, my car was demolished. Um, somehow I climbed out of the car. I didn't have a seatbelt on. All my windows were down, my sunroof was open, and I ended up in the passenger seat um, and still managed to walk away from the accident. Um, yeah, and uh, so the cops came, and obviously I wasn't in my right mind, so I actually tried to leave. I was determined to get wherever I was trying to go. Um, and my boss at the time, for whatever reason, he was out at that time of night and happened to see the wreck and saw that it was my car. So he was driving through the neighborhood and found me. And um, I went to the hospital. Um, at that time, I was also on probation. Like I said, I went to jail. So um, I had no license because it had been suspended. Um, so I shouldn't have been driving in the first place. And I... Um, I was devastated. Um, one of my friends at the time had gone up to the hospital with us because um, they took me. My lip partially busted through my, I mean, my teeth partially busted through my lip, and they just really wanted to have me checked out. And um, for whatever reason, they, uh, they didn't take me to jail when they had every reason they should have. Um, and so... I had gone with my friend after that, and they actually went to my mother's house while I was at the hospital. And my mom was just like, mm, I don't, <laughs> glad she's okay, but we're not coming up there, which was not usual for them. They're very supportive and loving, so, um, but they were pretty much done with my actions. And so um, I'm going to fast forward to, let's see, a few years later, I had, um, really gotten further involved into drugs and selling pain pills and addicted to pain pills. And um, it was miserable. It was miserable. It was great having money, but we were just miserable. And um, one night um, I had gone grocery shopping and I came home to find that uh, my friend had she was actually at my house. Um, she had texted me to tell me that somebody had tried to break into my house, and they were in the house. Um, it ended up being some people that we were friends with, or we thought we were, and they tore through our house. Well, my friend that was there that left had called the cops, and so when the cops showed up and they went through the house, obviously they found things there that gave them reason to take us to jail, and so I went to jail. Um, we both did, and <laughs> I actually, I mean, I had stuff on me at the time, too, that I had to hide on the way to jail in the back of a cop car, and um, in hopes that they didn't find, and while that night was devastating, it was the beginning of what really led us, led me to freedom. Um, Eight days prior to that, I had, um, like I said before, that I had ended up having an abortion. I found out that I was pregnant, and this, I just felt, I told my mom, I said, I just feel this, this evilness. I can't explain it. It just, I just feel like just this evilness taking over me about this whole thing, and um, it was actually my mom's best friend who helped raise me that I also is like another mother for me. Um, she was like, oh, you need to get an abortion then. You don't need to have it. You guys aren't living right. You're into all this stuff. It won't be healthy. His mom's crazy, and, you know, that's that. And I had gotten to a place where I felt really backed into a corner at that moment, like it was my only option, and I ended up um, agreeing to it. And, I mean, right in the middle of it, I instantly regretted it, and it tormented me for some time to come. Um, so... While I was at jail, um, when you're doing intake, they do give you a pregnancy test, and it still showed as me being pregnant. And so for some reason, even though I had been through this situation, I still had this inkling of hope that maybe I didn't, you know, actually have one. And 
was pregnant. Um, I wasn't, which was probably for the better at that time, um, because I wasn't done uh, making bad decisions. And so um, my parents, they got me out of jail, and they gave me the opportunity to come live with them, and there were rules. And at that time, I was not interested in following anybody's rules. So I um, ended up going and staying with a friend, and... Uh, my boyfriend at the time, we had to keep separate, and so we weren't supposed to be talking to each other, which, yeah, that meant nothing to us. But um, so, um, inevitably, I, they we went to court, and I ended up being put on probation. And while on that probation, I ended up getting connected with some people because I was bouncing around from house to house. Um, that were still using drugs, and I ended up doing them with them. And when I went to court for a violation that I had, I don't even remember what the violation was for. I think it, I think it was actually having to do with my address being wrong, um, which was silly at the time. But um, they did a drug test in the courtroom, or they asked me to do a drug test, and I intentionally held it as long as I could, which was all day long. Like, all day. This was in the morning, and they closed at 5. And I held out the entire day, and they called me into the probation office the next day to go take one, and, you know, you can do the cleanser things, and I passed it. And so when I went back to court, um, December 14th of 2011, I, um, they immediately said they were revoking everything and taking me to jail, which I was not prepared for. And so when they did, they also held me without bond. And I also decided that I needed to take my phone with me. And uh, that was a bad decision. Um, <laughs> they didn't find it on me going in. But later on, they were told by somebody who called up there that I had it. And um, so they, they charged me with it. So they gave me another felony um, for introduction of contraband. And um, they also put me in what they call lock which you're locked in a cell away from everybody else, no contact with anybody, nothing to read, nothing to write. The only thing to look at is the the wall. And so, and you sleep in this little plastic tub with a mat. And uh, so I had to sit there, and it was right before Christmas, and they gave me two weeks. And so my son at the time was still little, my oldest, and um, I didn't get to call him on Christmas. I didn't get to tell him Merry Christmas or that I loved him. Um, so my parents didn't know what was going on. And so by the time I did get to call them, you know, it already had passed. And so that kind of broke me a little bit. Um, and during that time that I was in there, that, that one time I was there from December until April, um, I believed for the opportunity to go into this faith-based program. Um, the one person that I had had counseling with that had been working. Um, She ran, she was the director of an inpatient rehabilitation program that was not your traditional faith-based program. And um, she would come to see me every week and I just kept believing and saying that this is where I'm going, this is where I'm going, I'm not going to prison. And the district attorney's well, the district attorney that was on my case was the newest in the district, so she was determined to um, make a name for herself, and the warden was really angry that I had managed to get a phone in there without what they call suitcasing it, um, and so he was determined to make an example out of me, so Coupled together, they were really pushing for prison time. And so my only offers were that. And um, so by the time I had gone to what they call evidentiary hearing, I had been given another offer um, for a couple, like two and a half years in prison. And I I decided that I wasn't going to sign for that. And I was still holding out hope for this. But at that point in time, I was like, I guess I'm going to have to go to prison, you know, but I mean, they're not giving me any more offers. I was out of offers. And so I had another court date coming up and 
Um, I wasn't really believing as much that I was going to this program, but I still had that hope for it. And um, because I knew that if I went to prison, that nothing would change, that I would become worse. And um, so four days before I was supposed to go to court, it was a Wednesday, um, my godmother had been asking my, my attorney and, and they were asking the state attorney about letting me do this program. And she was, it's not happening, like she's going to prison. And so four days before he ran into her at the courthouse and all of a sudden she was like, look, I'm getting transferred out of the district. So I don't really have time to try your case. And um, I'm gonna give you what you're asking for. Wow. And so, um, which is really exciting. Um, but then my godmother called um, the program place and she was like, I don't have a bed. <laughs> like, I would love to take her, but I don't have a bed. And mind you, I would have to sit in jail until a bed came available. So um, they don't come available very often. And she's like, I just sent an email out this morning um, offering that bed to somebody else. And so a few hours later, um, she gets a call back and, um, from the director and she's like, I don't really know what happened, but for some reason my email never went through. Wow. So I do have a bed for her. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, the next day she was able to pick me up and take me there. And I was not at all prepared for, for what would happen there and for how God would meet me there. Um, when I look back on that place, I still think like that was just holy ground. Um, and it, it was transformational. It's no longer open now, and I was the last one to go through that program, but um, I'm eternally grateful for that. And so I went to this place, and you don't have to pay right up front, but at some point you, have to, you do have to pay, and my parents were willing to pay for it, and they didn't know where they were gonna get the money from because, well, it wasn't cheap. And so, but that first month uh, when it was time to make that payment, they had gotten a letter in the mail with a check from their mortgage company for the exact amount that they needed as a refund. So glad you're listening to our podcast and we're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful and you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. And so I was sentenced to that place so I couldn't leave until I had completed the program, which was 13 months there and then six months of aftercare. Um, and I'd love to say that afterwards I didn't still make some some mistakes along the way, but there was a freedom that I found there that I would have never found in prison had I gone that route. And um, one of the things that really comes to mind often is in the chapel that we had there um, on the ceiling, or not ceiling, but just like a fur down. Um, it says, he who the sun sets free shall be free indeed. And um, I think that carried a lot of us through there. Um, and I, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for that, for the freedom that I found because of that. Wow. Wow. You know, um, it, I got a little emotional on, you know, the, the, when you were saying as far as that freedom, because I think a lot of times when it comes to like our prison system and those that are, they're forgotten, you know what I mean? They, I don't know why, but I don't know if God's driving us to do this one day where we're going to be involved in that as Revive, but we can easily just write people off because of their behavior and what they've done, right? Do they deserve it? I'm sure there's a lot of that, right? But Romans 8, 28 wouldn't weigh as heavy that God can take even what's bad and turn it for your good that in the middle of what would have been a punishment, what was a punishment, how God was able to still extract something that the enemy was trying to use against you. And so 
Isn't it beautiful to know that we have purpose, that God's not done, he's not finished writing our story, that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, whether it was our fault, we did it, we decided to do it, we were defiant, we just, you know, it's just, this is who I am, my environment. She came from a good home and made the decisions. And it's not always the environment we're in that causes us to be who we are. There's scholars that come out of the hood. There's, there's people that come out of poverty and end up becoming, you know, presidents and CEOs. And so it, it is choice driven, right? Our lives. And so, um, I'm sure you have another level of gratitude for God to see. No one would have ever expected for you to have gone through that or for you to be who who you used to be, right? And so we're just so grateful that you're able to share that story and we give God praise, amen, for her life, amen. Um, You know, Miguel, with you being by your wife's side and, and helping her go through that, you know, I think a lot of times it's something my dad said earlier today was, you know, he was blessed by the panel that was here for Spanish. And a lot of times as pastors, uh, we tend to to be expected that we got it all together. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we're good because we're supposed to be, right? But we're human. We have emotions, we have feelings, and we want to be blessed too, you know? So hearing your stories is blessing me, right? And and I'm sure my wife. And um, for you going through that as being, you know, a spiritual covenant for your wife who was praying for you and then you came to the, 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 the walk of Christ. How were you able to cultivate a spirit of gratitude in such a challenging situation? So that's the thing. At the time, I wasn't a believer. I came to know Christ three years ago and um, it was th- literally through divine revelation. Through that time after the miscarriage, um, I was a terrible husband. I am not, a, I'm not going to say I'm not ashamed of what I did, but I'm not ashamed to tell this part of the testimony because it glorifies God. Because for seven years, I done known my wife since we were 12 years old, dated, started dating around 15, 16 years old, got married at 20. For seven years, she prayed for my salvation. Here's the thing. We were unequally yoked in our marriage. What does that mean? I was an unbeliever. She was a believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, don't you know, you wives, that you, your families are sanctified because of your faith? Because of my wife's faith, I was set apart. And it was by his will that I got saved. Because his will is for everybody to be saved at the end of the day. But she didn't give up on her faith. So for me, spiritually, I wasn't all there. Um, I was treating her bad as a husband. Um, My wife saw it. I mean, my mom saw it. Her mom saw it. I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't that same uh, high school love that she thought of. And in a moment where she was about to walk out on a marriage, I didn't even know. That night she was about to walk out, God told her. Don't you, did you not forget about the promise that I made to that little girl? That you would have a God-fearing husband. Y'all would never be divorced. You will have a family. Did you forget? Like, do you not trust me? He's about to walk into the shower, and you're going to tell him everything you just told me in the, in, uh, through this prayer. That was my, and so I, sure enough, I did. I was playing 2K. <laughs> I was playing 2K, and I walked into the bathroom, and that was the first touch of God that I ever had. Like, I've never felt conviction before in my life. She's still going through all this pain. About six months later, I start to dig an interest for God. Um, it was through false doctrine, so I quit. I said, I don't want nothing to do with the church. I don't want nothing to do with God. And that's it. I had a friend coming over um, from here. It was my best friend from Colleen. He was supposed to arrive on October 2nd of 2020 in Washington State. I was in the Navy. He never showed up. I call him the next day. His mom answers crying on the phone saying that he just got into a really bad car accident. He's paralyzed from the neck down. I took that moment, and that was my first real prayer in my entire life. I cried, I cried, I cried, and I was like, well, God, if if you're so real, why, why would all this stuff happen? Why would all this stuff happen? My friend, he calls me 
a week later, holding the phone in his hand on FaceTime in the bed talking about, look at me. And that made me have hope in God. Because I was like, you don't understand, I was praying for you. Fast forward a couple days later, I get a direct revelation of God through a dream. To keep that, that's a super long story short, but I literally saw the book of Revelation before my eyes. I didn't grow up in church. The most I knew was the Lord's Prayer. That's what my mom taught me when we were kids. I didn't grow up in church, never read the Bible. And I kid you not, week, I can take y'all to Colleen Mall and I can tell you exactly where I was sitting. I thought it was real. I can see, smell, think. I didn't know I was asleep. And what happened was, it was the second coming I saw, the rider on the white horse, Revelation 19, the angels behind him with swords. and They weren't coming for hugs and kisses. It was judgment. But the elect was, took, was taken up. The faithful, the righteous, dressed in white. When I got up there, I started hearing, holy, holy, holy. I told my wife about it when I woke up. She was like, you have no idea. And that's what the angels sing at the, at, the foot of, uh, at, the throne of God, at the foot of God's throne. It was the seraphim. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know that. I, I didn't grow up in church. <laughs> you know, um, I have it tatted on my arm. You know, for those who were raised Catholic, I have St. Michael tatted on my arm. Revelation chapter 12, the devil be banished. Be banished from the heavens for a thousand years. I had it tatted on my arm. Didn't even know what it meant. I saw it. Didn't even stand a chance. It's like when you have the, your little brother and he's trying to fight you and you're just holding his head and he's just swinging and missing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, didn't have a, he didn't stand a chance. No, no power is greater than, than God's power. It was like that. Easy. When I got to heaven, I can't tell you what heaven looked like. But all I saw was people of all ages, old, young, white, black, praising God. Revelation 19.1. Honor, glory, dominion, and power. They're just singing. I woke up, cried my eyes out because I was like, I thought that really happened. So from then on, that divine revelation allowed me. It was as if um, in Romans 1... It says that nobody has an excuse not to know God. Later on in chapter 3 of Romans, it talks about our conscience bears witness. When I woke up from that dream, literally, I immediately knew what everything I did was sinful. How I treated my wife was sinful. How I wasn't representing her as, uh, representing God as the man of the house. Everything, every single little thing. I was like, I, I felt like when Peter... <laughs> At when uh, he was like, oh, I'm just, I'm a sinful man. Every single thing came to my revelation that moment. My life changed complete 180 after that day. Wow. wow. And so with that, after all that stuff happened, that's where my outlook started to change. Because as a baby Christian at the time, it's crazy to say that after three years, I've seen so much in three years. It's, it's crazy. Don't base, for those who are sitting here, don't base your age or how long you've known Christ through church attendance. I've heard many people tell me, I would have thought that you would grow up in church your whole life, but that's only because I've sat in his presence for the last three years. Get in the presence of God. That's how you're going to know God. If you don't know nothing, get in your word. Stay in the presence of God because you're not going to know who he is or what's real or what's fake or what's from the enemy or what's a lie if you don't stay in his presence. Mm -hmm. Because through that, I got to see how good a God, a God is, how much of a father he is. I didn't have a father in my life. My mom was married, but I, I tell you straight up, I saw him as my basketball coach. Wow. I saw him as a basketball coach. He wanted me to call him dad, and I said, I can't. It doesn't feel real to me. Now my mom's married, and that's the closest thing to a dad that I ever had. Wow. And I thank God for you, Josue. I thank God for you, man. Because I've never seen nobody treat my mom the way you do. And you came in at the right time, and God saved you at the exact right time. And that was a promise that God gave me 
was because of my faith, my family would be saved. And so seeing you get saved gave me hope. Amen. I never had a father, and God, that's my gratitude. Wow. I now have an earthly father, but he showed me how good of a father God really is. Because wow. that's what he is. I call him Abba. Wow. Abba Father. Amen. Amen. Wow. Man, when you experience a true encounter with God, it doesn't leave you the same, right? And it's beautiful to hear that it wasn't in a setting that we would traditionally think is right here on the altar in the front, right? Having a moment, God was, he had to pluck you out, right? Uh, because there was purpose in what was about to happen in your lives together. I'm going to ask one final question, and um, I think it's a, uh, now that you obviously we're seeing your, your, your story is not done, right? You know, you're about to start a family, right? You know, Christy, you, you're, you're continuing, you have your sons, you have, it's, it's beautiful to see and you'll never forget, right? What happened or where you came from or what could have been or, right? But to, to live with gratitude today is not just thanking him for what he's already done, right? Is living that lifestyle and that attitude of saying, I'm giving you thanks regardless, Right? No matter the circumstance, I give you thanks. And whether you're a, a wife in the room today and you're, you're, you've been trying, you and your husband have been trying to have a baby. You know, I, I don't know why for Marie and I in 2020, it was, a, it was a surprise for those who know our story where Maria got pregnant, you know, in, in 2020, quarantine, you know what I'm saying? And so, but if you don't know, I had, I had the surgery four years before that. We thought we weren't going to be the 0.01%, you know what I mean? That was, going to, that was going to end up that way. And uh, God did a miracle and my wife became pregnant while we had a teenage daughter and a soon teenage son where we thought we were done. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't understand any of the baby stuff today. It doesn't make sense to me what's been invented. And for us to get pregnant, there was a moment of bitterness because we were praying for people that we're trying to get pregnant. And here we are not wanting this, to be honest. We were like, we didn't plan for that, no. And for, for I, to my wife's face, women would say, I was upset at you because you were pregnant. And my wife was like, it's not my fault. You know, it's like, we, we did everything to prevent it, right? Up to a surgery. Well, Jovan was purposed to be here. But that feeling of like, that I can only imagine for a woman who's waiting, a family who's waiting, right? And to see you, Passion, still dancing, still serving, still knowing that you were in pain, we would ask you, how are you doing, Passion? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And you would tell you, we knew you were in pain, you know? And still doing that. And it's beautiful to know that you didn't allow the circumstance, and though you had every right to, that you didn't allow the circumstance to stop you, right? From moving forward and believing the promise that God gave you, right? And for you, Christy, I think the beauty of your story, it's, it's amazing to say beauty of your story, right? It is to know that no matter what has happened, no matter what has done, your identity is not found in what, was, what happened to you in the past. I would be one of the least ones to expect that you went through that. When you said, I'm manipulative, can I, I was like, that's not, that's not the Christian I know, right? That I've grown to know, right? But it's beautiful that when you have an encounter with God and he surrounds you with the right people and you're in community, how things begin to change, right? I don't know about you. If you're here and, and you just show up and go home, um, I, I, I encourage you to get into community. What's beautiful about them is they're, they're part of small groups. You know, they lead small groups. Christy's part of a small group. She, she, her parents hosted one of the last ones and with Brittany Pia's group, and it was beautiful. And it's something to see when you can be in community with people, you're not doing life alone, amen? Or you can arrive and feel like there's purpose here where I'm at. I'll close it with this question. Um, if I had to tell someone why I'm a believer, I would have to say, what would that be? Why, why am I a believer? Why aren't you? His evidence is literally everywhere. 
His invisible attributes is everywhere. Throughout creation, it even testifies. No, science testifies of God's creation, of his existence. The problem is, is that we choose not to believe. Everything has a natural order to it. On a specific day, fall comes. On a specific day, winter comes. The sun's going to set at this time. The moon's going to rise at this time. The birds are going to migrate at this season. The butterflies are going to migrate during this season. And it's just like what Jesus says. He controls it all. Everything is set in stone. The reality of God is honestly so simple. But we as humans choose our own fleshly desires or our own way of thinking and convince ourselves that he's not real. So why don't you? I would say he's too good not to be. Um, you know, they say, you know, obviously he'll leave the 99 to find that one. He'll, he'll go into the depths of darkness to pull you out and he won't leave you there. You have to take his hand, but he will not leave you there. He comes for you no matter where you are. He kicks down walls. He literally sets the captives free. Uh, my husband's a testimony for that. Um, so his goodness is just everywhere. If you're willing to see it. Amen. Amen. I think uh, I'm grateful for, for you guys being able to share today. You know, we're celebrating in what God is doing in both of your lives, all three of your lives. Amen. Uh, you know what's beautiful? And, and if we had so much more time, we could just keep going. There's so many great stories that... And, and each person, you know, uh, what's beautiful even in, in Miguel and Passion's story is that God's given them a child, right? And it's coming. We're declaring health and it's going to be soon. We're, we're all going to be old. And at least I know I am. And so, um, but even so, how God's led you guys. And uh, just recently, they bought a house. Didn't have to put anything down. So it's like God's timing for this child to arrive he was setting things up and you didn't even have to work that hard for it. Promotion at work, I mean, increase in salary. God's just been doing that and just the influence that he's given all three of you has been so beautiful and just, I, I, I'm, I'm really big on, these three are working with the next generation. Christy's in the back working with our kids. Miguel and Passion are here every Sunday night working with our teenagers. They're sharing their faith with the next generation to show them so they could carry it on and so forth and keep going, right? And so it's so beautiful living a life of gratitude, knowing that, man, God, you have everything in control. Amen. Can we all stand to our feet? You know, can we give it up one more time for Miguel Passion and Christy? Come on, y'all. Can we just love on them for a moment? You know, the, the biblical truth is this. God does the planning, we do the preparing. God is the one who says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. I said it earlier, but God is not finished writing your story. Amen? And so we choose to give thanks. We choose to live a life of gratitude, to be grateful for what he's done, for what he continues to do, for what he hasn't even done yet. Our story is being written by him. And for a lot of us in the room, we would not be where we are if it wasn't for him. Amen? And so we, we, that's why we give thanks. Amen? So I want you right where you are. If you could just bow your head and just close your eyes. And let's just take a moment right now to just give God thanks, right? Right where you're at. Maybe he's coming to the realization right now in your life and you're saying, wow, Lord, I, I have a reason to give God thanks. I've seen his goodness. I've seen what he's done in my life. I've seen what he continues to do. I have a reason to just say thank you, right? And maybe you, you have a similar story as them. Maybe you're, you're a couple that's waiting and you've been waiting for a long time 
And you're saying, God, is that miracle going to arrive? Is the miracle on its way? I'm believing that if God did it for Pastor and Miguel, God is going to do it and can do it for you. Maybe you feel like my identity is found in my past. I, I cannot walk away from what's happened, from what I've done, from the consequences of, of life. And I feel like I'm just in a rut. I'm stuck there. And I truly believe that in the story that Christy shared today of her life, which is still being written, which God is still there, is a story that God's writing in your life today. You are not your environment. You are not who your parents were. You are not your past choices. You are who God says you are. You are a child of God. And, and the key word that Pasha said today as we pray here in a moment, she said, it was through obedience to God that I saw my blessing. It was when I gave obedience to God and I submitted to him that blessing arrived. And so Father, we just come to you right now in this moment giving you thanks. Lord, as we submit our lives to you, we submit our ways to you, we submit our thoughts, we submit our worries, we submit our future, our goals, our dreams, we submit them to you right now, Jesus. Lord, overall, we submit our past, we submit our hurts, our pains, all that that keeps us and prevents us from being grateful. We give it to you right now. Lord, that you're able to heal hearts in this room. Lord, that you're able to reveal that you've been there, that you haven't been far. Lord, that people can feel today that you are closer than we are. Closer than we think you are. Lord, that we're able to feel an assurance and knowing, Lord, that you have our best in your hands. And so we submit ourselves to you, Lord. Do as you will, Father. Lord, that we can have a true encounter with you in your presence. A true encounter with your word and, and with who you are, Lord, so that there's change that begins to happen and chains begin to fall in our lives. So, Father, we want to live a life of gratitude today. In Jesus' name. Come on, we all say amen, amen. You know, um, I want to give an opportunity for you as we just pray and we're closing here. You know, maybe it's been difficult for you to have a life of gratitude. It's been difficult for you to be thankful because it hurts so much, right? Maybe you're in a situation and, and I, I, don't, I don't feel right to not ask, is there a couple that's in the room that you have been trying and you've been waiting, but you, it hasn't happened yet for you? If that's you, do you mind just lifting your hands where you're at? You've been trying. Can you come forward for me? Is there anyone else? There's a couple in the room that you've been trying. You've been trying to, to have a family and, and it's just not happening. It just hasn't happened yet. If that's you guys, come forward. Come on. Amen. Come on. I don't know if you feel legacy in the room. Come on. Like you feel like there's something that's about to happen because our faith is being raised in this moment. Amen. Kent, come up forward. Come up forward. I'm ask my wife to come forward too. Oh, you're already here, baby. Thank you. Pastor Miguel, is there any woman that's in the room, a wife that you waited a long time, but God gave you that miracle? God gave, you could testify that you waited. God gave you that miracle. Brenda, if you can come forward to help pray. Women that are in the room that God gave you life, where you lost a child through miscarriage, but you received your miracle. You had to go through a process. If that's you, lift your hands. Ladies, if you can come forward, I, I want you to pray for these women here. If your husband is here too, come forward. I believe there's miracle ground. That God will give you your heart's desire. Amen. And so if God did it with passion and God did it with these strong women, I'm believing it for it in Jesus name. That we will see the miracle, that you will hold your miracle one day. Come on, just pray, just pray. Lift them up. Father, encourage them. Lift them up, Father. Lord, that it begins now, Lord, that they're not giving up, that this is part of the process. Lord, that it wasn't a running joke, Lord. It's not a bad news. It's not a written report. It's not, Father, right now, Lord, that you begin to make way, Father, from their womb right now in Jesus' name. 
And Father, if it's on the, on the spouse, Father, that you start doing what it needs to be done, Father, healing in Jesus' name in each body. Lord, that you start right now, Father, a legacy begins in their lives. Lord, that what their heart desires in Jesus' name, that if you did it with passion, if you did it with my wife, if you did it with so many of the women that are here today, Lord, and the couples in representation, Lord, of, of what you did in their own lives, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we are believing for it right now for each couple represented. Lord, that if there was loss, Father, Lord, that you can bring, Lord Jesus, healing, restoration, Lord, that you can bring peace in their lives. But Lord, right now, Lord, that you start making way that they start seeing you for who you are, Father. Lord, that they continue to turn to you, Lord. Lord, that right now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Lord, can we believe radically and say before the end of the year, come on, can we raise our faith to say, God, you will do a work before the end of the year, Father. And Lord, can we have gratitude to say, Lord, even if it doesn't, Lord, it is in your time just as you gave to passion. It is in your time, Father. It will arrive in Jesus' name. We are declaring it with a radical faith, Lord, saying before the end of the year, Father. Lord, that we can raise our faith that even if it crosses from one day to the other, Lord, we're believing it will happen in Jesus' name. That it will happen in Jesus' name. It will happen in Jesus' name. It will happen in Jesus' name. By your stripes, we are healed, Father. Lord, strengthen each marriage and representation here, Lord. To look towards each other, Lord. To not fight towards each other because of it not happening yet, Lord. Lord, that they can grow closer and closer in love, Lord. Knowing, Lord Jesus, that you have them in your hands. In Jesus' name, we will see the miracle in their hands. Amen, amen. As they keep praying, maybe... Maybe you feel like your identity has been found in something that's happened in your past and you've been reminded of it way too much. Can I tell you, there's freedom right now in the room where you can release that and say, you know what? Maybe you went to prison in the past. Maybe you felt like you don't feel free today, whatever it may be, but I can tell you right now that there is freedom in Jesus. Amen? And if you're a person right now that's been holding on to something, it's been hard to be grateful. It's been hard to see it. You feel like you've continued to suffer the consequences of what's happened in your past. If that's you right where you're at, do you mind raising your hand saying, I no longer want to be like this anymore. I want to let this go. Come on, I want to release this right now. If that's you, I want to release this. If that's you, lift your hands right where you're at. I want to start anew. Amen. I see you. I see you. I want to start anew. If you see somebody's hand raised, do you mind touching their, their shoulder right where you're at? Amen. Come on, let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, every single person that's responding in this moment, Lord Jesus, Lord, that has felt, Lord, that they need freedom, Lord, that right now, Lord Jesus, they want to live a life of gratitude, Lord. They want to give you thanks for everything, Lord. Lord, but life has tried to weigh heavy on them, Father. Right now, in Jesus' name, we pray and we believe, Lord, that you will visit every situation, you will visit every hurt and every pain, Father. Lord, that you bring freedom in their life right now, in Jesus' name, that they're able to release and let go of all that's been holding them back, Lord, that they're able to forgive themselves, forgive their past, forgive, Lord Jesus, and be able to move forward for what you have in store for their lives. Lord, we're believing this in Jesus' name that they experience freedom. Lord, that life begins now. Lord, that all that they've had to face and all that they've gone through, Lord Jesus, Lord, you can use it for their good. Lord, that it's be used for to glorify your name, that their story, their testimony will help free many other people. Father, we believe it so. Come on, church, and we say in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we celebrate in the room? I'll close with one final thing and, and then we're done. You know, life begins when we give our lives to Jesus. And something that I've said in the past is a lot of times we ask God and we ask for Jesus to be a savior in our life, to save us in our situation, save us in our circumstance. But it's difficult to make him Lord of our lives. 
And to make him Lord of your life is saying, I died to my wants, I died to my needs, I died to what hasn't happened yet, to what I long, and say, you know what? I want to make you Lord of my life. Lead me, guide me. And for some of us, it may be that. We've seen Jesus as Savior, but you need Jesus as Lord of your life right now. And so I ask you, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity right now. And maybe you've done it before, but life weighed heavy. Circumstances happen and you've walked away. Jesus is reminding us today, I've never walked away. I'm here. So decide for him right now. It's our last call and we're done. If today you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right where you're at, just lift your hands right where you're at. Say, you know what? Today, I want to choose him. Amen. If that's you, just acknowledge it right now.